Okay. Call the committee of the whole meeting to order for February 13th, 2018. First item on the agenda is roll call. Losado? Here. Atec? Here. Stark? Salate? Here. Callahan? Here. Slay? Here. Meitzler? Here. <laughs> you her? Here. Cerrone? Here. McFadden? Here. Chansit? Here. O'Brien? Brown? Wolf? Here. Okay. We have the necessary quorum to conduct business. Um, next on the agenda is the approval of minutes for January 23rd, 2018. Anybody have any corrections? Additions, changes, anything? Thank you. Would you like to make a motion? So moved. Motion by Silvati. Second. Second. And Meisler. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Go on consent. Um, items to be added, removed, or changed. Uh, we're going to change, let's see, what is it? 13, 13 and 14, we're going to move up to. Five and six. We'll put them in at the end of matters from the public. What would those be? Four A and four B, or yeah, we should. Yeah. yeah, we should probably not change the whole number. Just change. Just add four A and B. Now that they're matters from the public. Well, it's going to be in between yeah. one and five, right? That's what. Four point one, four point five. How about Robo Five A? Four point one, four point two. Four point one, four point two. Let's have a discussion. About <laughs> okay, so then we will um, change those two items. The order. Um, somebody would like to make a motion on that? So second. Motion by Kansas. Mm -hmm. Second by Cerrone. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Okay, motion carries. Um, so that will take us to matters from the public. Does anybody have anything from the public that's not on the agenda? Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Joanne Spitz. Um, I have three things. One, whenever I get up here, I always want to thank you all for everything you do. I don't think you get thanked enough for all the work that you guys put into every topic that goes on in Batavia, so thank you. Second, I'm a co-chair of CHIP in Batavia. We help students who are homeless or low-income in Batavia. And we have 1,055 in that category right now in our town. Mm. And one of the biggest things that we are doing um, now is working on our prom dress drive giveaway. So that's what I wanted to tell you about. And I'm going to leave post um, some flyers with Lucy. <laughs> um, we have it at the Batavia Public Library. It's our fifth year. We are collecting dresses now until March 16th. We also collect shoes, accessories, and purses. And any girl from any district can come and get a dress for free. Um, sometimes we give more than one if they have something special to go to. Um, sometimes mother's shop. And if they can give a donation if they want to, we accept it and use it for uh, tuxes for the boys or for we pay for prom tickets for kids who can't afford it. So uh, last year we gave out over 165 dresses that included donating to the clothes closet and eight, uh, to Rotolo for the eighth grade dinner dance. So um, it's gotten bigger. We have 200 in storage already from last year and the library has been very gracious in um, taking donations and then they store them for us. Prairie State Packaging is donating wardrobe boxes so they stay clean. We have a seamstress there to help girls for free um, get their dresses fitted. It's, it's a really fun day. Um, I, it's really great. So I just wanted to tell you all about that. And I'm also on the Bulldogs Unleashed Committee, and I wanted to thank the city for your tremendous support with that project. We have 29 Bulldogs that will be on the streets in June for the summer. Uh, 14 were purchased outright. The rest will go to auction on September 15th at the Eastside Community Center. So it's been a lot of fun. We look forward to meeting with the city tomorrow. <laughs> and thank you. Okay, next up as we change the agenda will be uh, the wastewater treatment plant update, monthly update.
Thank you. Okay. Uh, for the monthly update for the treatment plant, uh, just get right into it. Uh, this is the work that we accomplished and since the last report, uh, so in the month of January. Uh, the main building up at the north end of the plant is progressing. Concrete walls in the first floor for the entire building are placed, and they're working on the masonry walls as well. They've built enclosures so they can do uh, the masonry work in the cold weather. Obviously, a lot of the cold and snow has slowed down progress, but they're still moving forward. Uh, the electricians and the plumbers are working on rough-ins in the main building as well, trying to keep up with the concrete and the masonry. Uh, the chlorine building, electrical, and HVAC is ongoing. It's almost complete. Uh, so that building is uh, up to temperature, and now they can finish out some of the equipment that we have in there. The digester operations building excavation has begun at long last, so now we're starting to get into the, the south end of the site and unearthing all the things that are there. And there's been uh, some insulation of 36-inch mixed liquor pipe and uh, about 150 feet of the 8-inch uh, digested sludge pipe. So we're almost complete with the piping underground and we're getting very close to starting the digester ops building construction. A little update on costs so far. The numbers up there indicate what we've spent in engineering and construction uh, just under $8,800,000. Uh, estimated progress is 46%. You'll notice that's the same that I told you last month. Um, with getting an update from the contractor to have their pay requests end on the fiscal year or on the calendar year, we got an update on the uh, construction schedule that was uh, pushed a little bit early, and so we haven't received the next schedule update. So from here on out, that number will increase, but between this update and the last update, that number is the same. As far as change orders, um, I'll talk about change order number four in a little bit, but so far we are right at 1% uh, change orders, including the change order that I'm bringing forward today at $272,586. I'll touch on schedule. I have a tendency to gliss over this, so I wanted to touch on a couple key points so you guys know what uh, I'm looking at. It's quite difficult to see. It's very small. There's a lot of different activities for the project, but the top section where you see those red bars, anytime you see a red bar, that's a critical path activity. So when we're talking about change orders and things like that, those are the tasks that are affected. Um, right now, the contractor is showing that he's about 28 days behind schedule. And like I said, um, last meeting that we were planning on meeting with the contractor talking about ways to compress the schedule, more efficient ways of stacking activities. Um, those changes are not reflected in the schedule yet, but they will be next month, just so you know. But right now the project is tracking about a month behind. When we met with the contractor uh, a couple weeks ago to go through these items, which I think it was last week, <coughs> Um, the schedule was brought up to about 10 days behind schedule. So it shifts quite a bit just based on how you stack those critical path activities that pushes out the deadline or brings it back in. So I anticipate that's going to be much smaller of a delay in construction next time I present. Let's go through some project photos. Uh, here's the main building in January. And here's a shot from the same perspective, uh, February 3rd. I didn't get any... Drone flights uh, last Friday was a little bit difficult, so <laughs> please forgive me. Um, this is another perspective. This is facing east, uh, so this is the backside of uh, the main building. You'll see between uh, a month ago and February 3rd, there's quite a bit of progress on the concrete and the masonry enclosure is what's in white in the, near the bottom of the screen there. The dig for the digester operations building, back in January there was no dig. It was uh, as it was when we started the construction with the absence <laughs> of the asphalt. Here the dig is started. You see near the middle of the screen we're starting to unearth uh, the area where the digester operations building is going to go. Um, I wanted to make sure that you were aware that when we were digging for uh, the digester operations building, we did find <clears throat> some abandoned in place foundations for a building that was previously just buried. Uh, we removed that. It's going to end up being added in as a change order, um, but it was taken out in the matter of maybe five hours. So it was actually relatively quick and easy to remove, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of it. So that's the presentation for the monthly report. Uh, if you, anybody has any questions, I'm here.
Was that a building that we had left there, or is that something from prior to us having operations there? Yeah, there was, a, there was an operations building. Okay. Just curious on that. <laughs> Used to be a chlorine building. And the big question that keeps popping up constantly, especially on social media, when it's nice out and everybody's walking about town, when do we think we're going to have this covered again? What's open and what smells? <laughs> what's open and what smells is the lack of digestion. And right. so uh, we are working with uh, the city and uh, the contractor to put together some temporary odor control systems that we've okay. designed just because of the <laughs> frequent comments and concerns okay. from the public, <laughs> me being one of them. Um, so uh, that's ongoing. Um, I hope that by the next time I talk with you, those systems are in place uh, okay. because that will come the spring weather and that will come uh, the bigger concerns. But most of the odors are contained down at the south end of the plant uh, near the sludge handling building. Because I know that's like one comment that keeps popping up and it just everybody has to be reminded that we're in the middle of rebuilding the wastewater treatment plant and that's why. Yep. So. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? Comments? Okay. Let's go to the change order. Okay. Next. <clears throat> so change order number four uh, includes several items that uh, were unforeseen conditions, things that we've uh, excavated out and discovered were out of place or in the wrong place uh, or that we didn't simply know were there. Uh, some of the big ticket items uh, include uh, CMRs 32 and 34. Those include areas where we had to pipe around obstacles that we found or that we uh, found where pipes were not where they're supposed to be. Um, the grand total for, C for change order number four is $54,578. And like I said in the presentation, in fact, let's bring this up. <clears throat> so like I said, that's, that's approximately 1% of the total cost for the project um, in change orders with this change. Now, just for perspective, that is, um, there are some items here that were covered by what we have, what we call allowances. In the contractor's base bid number, he had $200,000 worth of allowances that we would use as we see fit for things like electrical service issues, gas service issues, piping conflicts. So we have uh, used up 50 of the $200,000, so there's $150,000 left to cover additional unforeseen issues. Okay. Anybody have any questions on this? Just a clarification. Well, I, I'm super happy to see it's only 1% at this point in time. Um, I thought the prior slide said something about 46% complete. Is that? Yes. Ballpark? So of the 26 million, 46% complete? Of the 26 million, the, the, the construction 26 million contract or the, or the construction. Okay. That's the that's contractor's estimate of how far along he is in construction. Got it. Okay. Now, there are a lot of big ticket items that come in on the tail end that we right. pay off, like equipment and things like that, that make up a big chunk of that price. Okay. So I just want to clarify the 46%. Yeah. Progress and dollars don't mm -hmm. rack identically. Okay. Anybody care to make a motion on the Change order number four, which is resolution 18-27-R, authorizing a change order with number four with Williams Brothers Construction Incorporated for the wastewater treatment plant rehabilitation project. So moved. Second. Motion by Ewer, second by Silvati. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, motion carries. And put that on consent. No, let's leave it on regular agenda so we can talk about it. and. Let people know that there is somewhat of a solution coming up for some yeah. <laughs> home before the spring. Okay. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Next up, we'll go back to the regular order to agenda, and that will get us to number five, which is Ordinance 18 13, vacation of a public alley behind 321 to 337 mm -hmm. East Wilson. Scott. Yes, yeah, so this uh, came out of the Park District and the um, improvements that they're proposing to the East Side Community Center. 
Um, we have an, actually a public alley that is along that is east west along the south end of their parking lot uh, behind the homes and businesses along uh, East Wilson Street. Park District is part of their reconfiguration. They've been maintaining this alley for years. We're not actually plowing it or anything like that. Um, as part of the reconfiguration of the parking lot, the Park District asked us to vacate this alley uh, so they can incorporate it within their development plans. Uh, it would be, continue to be used as part of their driveway and parking areas. Um, the Park District has agreed as part of this to allow for the continued access uh, to the adjacent properties along Wilson Street. Uh, they do, the three <coughs> different property owners uh, do uh, get access to their garages and the back parts of their lots through this alley. Um, so we would retain an ingress, egress, and public utility easement over the alley after it's vacated. Um, the only exception is at, this, at the far western end, um, and it's a little hard to see. Let me see if I can zoom in a little bit. So the property owner uh, at the far western end of, of this um, has two garages actually that encroach into the alley already. I'm not sure how that happened, whether it was just a surveying error or a permitting error or what have you. Um, they've been there for quite some time, so um, it's, it's been an existing encroachment. They encroach uh, almost eight feet into that alley. Um, so as part of that, um, during our discussions with the Park District, uh, the Park District was agreeable to allowing eight feet of that alley to be vacated to that property owner so that they can have their uh, garages be legal. Um, I believe they have some plans to reconstruct those buildings and reconfigure them. Um, so that would allow them to do that since they are in a, uh, um, in a uh, uh, downtown mixed use district. So they would be able to do that. The setbacks are, are zero for that kind of an, an encroachment. So um, we do have a utility line actually that goes across one of those garages. Um, so if there were any modifications that would have to be either relocated or buried or, or what have you. So. Um, so as part of that, that's, that, that's uh, part of the vacation, why it would be a little bit different than uh, we normally would uh, do that. So um, let me get back to the plat for a second here. So this shows basically how the area would be vacated. So you'd have the eight feet that would be vacated to the property owner on the far western end of the alley, and everything that else then would be vacated to the park district. Nick? Uh, yeah, the, the property owner actually is here. He's a resident in my ward. Um, he is asking for an extra five feet extension so he can reconfigure those garages and um, alter the doors face the uh, alleyway. He wants to turn them inside. Um, so it would actually, there's one benefit in that you won't, wouldn't have to, you know, enter the garages from the alleyway, but it would also gain four parking spots that he's utilizing on Wilson right now. I, uh, he, he's here, if any, you know, willing to talk about it, but I'm thinking that if we um, vacate the alley that we amend it to include another five feet that we could at least investigate what the options are before uh, turning it over to the parking lot or the parking park district. And, and I did talk to the park district about that issue, um, and I, I had asked them, the uh, property owner also to talk to the park district directly about it as well. Um, park district is concerned because they feel that an additional five feet is going to cause a, um, a geometric issue with the parking lot uh, because they're already using that area for their driveway. So if we give them another five feet, now they're going to have to reconfigure their own parking lot and maybe lose parking spaces on the east side center, as well as there's some drainage issues that would be involved in that too. So that's, that's the concern of the park district. Right, and it's valid. And when you go and, and see there's an, a cement apron already coming out that is there that isn't going to change, he's probably, he's optimally looking to build maybe two feet and keeping a couple of feet to put a fence that will close... Uh, horizontally across the property. It's, uh, I mean, I'm not here to say, I mean, we would have to go through the, the variance process and see if it's possible, but if we turn it over to the park district, we're saying no to somebody who wants to put, a, you know, do some economic development, supply four extra parking lots for us right across from Lozadi's, right down from one Washington place. I think we should at least investigate that before we turn it over to the parking, uh, the park district. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that. I, I went by and looked at it myself, and it, it does make a lot of sense because uh, as if it's just done as proposed here, the doors for the garage will still face that alley and still pose a problem, which the, the property owner has a problem with accessing those garages as it is because the, uh, there's uh, oftentimes uh, trucks parked there for loading and unloading the east side center. Um, I think this, is a, and, and the idea of freeing up four spaces that are, uh, are utilized on Wilson that would then be, could be configured within his property in the back, I think uh, would be a win-win and, and a definite gain in parking for, for the city and uh, uh, for a small amount um, of that, of, of property that we currently possess. Um, so I agree with Nick that before, you know, we need to further explore this before turning it over uh, to the park district. Yeah, I guess I'd be concerned with what the drainage would be because I'm pretty sure isn't there a manhole right, I would say, corner of the parking lot and that apron, and that yeah. would be the what southwest corner of the parking lot. I believe I think so. Think that's where it drains to that side, kind of from the middle of the parking lot. Let's see if we can see it. So down in the the left lower corner of that picture. I'm not sure if the resolution will show it. Necessarily, but I believe there was something in this. There's a structure down there, like where somewhere down all the sidewalks vicinity. come together, right? The corner of that right. building. Mm. Unfortunately, the resolution doesn't show it very well here, so I guess I don't have a problem with trying to reconfigure that to gain some more parking if they're going to use that internally on their own property versus the street. I guess I just that's. I think tight in that corner anyway to try to turn through the way the parking lot is laid out now. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to see us take away parking from what's there now mm -hmm. to create a different parking situation here. You're shifting the parking from the park district onto private property. There is parking There is parking on street in front, um, and I'm not sure that they would be able to put the parking spaces that they'd like to without getting some type of a variance either because there may be some setbacks and green space requirements. Um, for those parking spaces in, in our ordinance. So I, I haven't looked into that, but that, that is a possibility that they'd have to go into too. So just because they might be able to fit four spaces doesn't mean that they can under the ordinance right now. So, And I would think too with the, with the park district opening up parking behind there, I don't think that that's going to be used 100% of the time. Right. You know, I mean, there would be quite a bit of parking, I think, that they're going to add to it, correct? Mm -hmm. How many spaces is the park district going to add to the... The property. Um, it was quite a few. I mean, this this it's two lots that they're where the houses are coming. Down. <laughs> Correct, right? So you can kind of see it here. This this is one of the configurations. There, there's a couple of different configurations that have been going on. So all mm -hmm. so a lot of this along the north end and then the east end is all new parking. I'm not sure though, but I don't think they foresee that being public parking. I mean, it is it is now. <laughs> right. so, yeah, I'm just saying. Out. Do we, do you you know, there's business owners not allowed right. to park there currently. Marty? I would agree with everything that Tony and Nick said, just because if the park district knows that it's a parking problem and they're trying to solve a parking problem in the area, this is allowing a little bit more comprehensive parking to be uh, looked at at once altogether instead of trying to piecemeal it. Let's do it all together with the whole thing. Yeah. I would add it gives the park district, I mean, as the garages are configured now, they mm -hmm. really can't use that space as a loading zone. If the garage is swung so the door's mm -hmm. facing okay, inward now, it gives them that side of the garage to use as, as a loading zone to the East Side Community Center, which is something that they appear to need based on the number of times trucks are parked in front of the garage for loading there. I, I guess my fear is, is if you look at the layout of what's up there, you take away another five feet from that and you take away half of one of the lanes to go through for ingress and egress to the the full parking lot. Yeah, I, I think if you if you get out there and look at it and you see where the where there's the garage and then there's mm -hmm. five feet of sidewalk out in front of the garage. The apron. The apron, mm -hmm. you're you're really not losing five feet of a yeah. lane. Can we, You'd be, yeah, if you can you pull up Google Maps, I think it portrays it probably a little bit better because you can see the apron. You can, I mean, nobody should be driving there anyway in that five feet. 
Yeah, the when you, five feet issue is going to cause more issues for the private property owner that they can't access and use their property. It's going to be them trying to get in all the time, and if they're loading and unloading at Chandler What I'm Hall, saying is if you take the area that's there now and you have to have a lane for a car to go each way in it, and you move that out five feet halfway into or you know into what's the probably a 16 foot wide lane there now then you can't pass cars through there or the park district would have to move their parking further north to be able to provide two lanes of traffic through there i think that's some of the problem is there's it's not really a lane right now as it's kind of a larger loading zone it's very I, yeah, yeah, you, can see, you can see the configuration here so right now the way the parking lot is it's you know comes down here and then they have to make this turn if you now push this over here you're ch you're truncating that radius here where it's going to be much more difficult for them to get in and out of here right but the so, apron shows what apron he's asking for feet. it's the five mm -hmm. feet right there correct but i'm saying then this is going to be a building and that's going to then be well he wouldn't use the whole five he, he wants leaving space for a fence i mean which is obviously just like a building but um he's not building right up to the edge of it Irregardless, it, are people driving on the apron right now? I guess the question is: is I, I'm assuming that they are. I don't know. Well, there's a car parked. It looks like it drove straight in through the apron, through the yeah. shadow that's there. Yeah. I mean, there's a car parked there now. Pretty close. Isn't it? Which is illegally parked. That's not a spot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and if you look at the situation here, the, the property owner also has adequate room in the front to make modifications too. So, I mean, it's not necessary for some expansion of that property to use the public alley encroachment. I mean, they can make some configuration changes and use some more of the front yard. That is a possibility as well. But I think that possibility limits uh, future economic development that could be done there. Well, there's always a limitation on how much you can do with any one property, obviously. I mean, so, there's... So I was out there, and if you stand on the concrete apron and you line it up, if you look on the that's the resolution on the the map here um, shows that the the uh, concrete apron is actually kind of tapered. And if you stand on the end of that and you look down that alley, that concrete apron lines up with the side of the uh, access off the off of Prairie. You like over here? Yeah. So when you look at that whole thing, if you if you drew a line, it, it continued that apron line. You would line right up with that, and so. I think that that's along with the grass that, to the west. That's that inhibiting <clears throat> too much now. It's not used now for <clears throat> parking, except for when trucks are there and blocking that his access. Yeah, unfortunately, the park district isn't here tonight to you know. talk about it. But you know, I thought they were going to be here tonight, but um, they could explain a little bit better why they, they feel that it, it's necessary, but I think that's part of it is pushing it. I mean, you push the building here, now you're pushing everything in the parking lot and they have to redesign, you know, what they're planning to do with that driveway access and everything. So. Right. And, and maybe it can't, I'm not saying, but if, if we vacate it, we're shutting down potential economic development. If we keep it open, or, or amend it to include 13 feet instead of the eight feet, we at least can investigate this further with maybe the park district being a little more open, knowing that they don't necessarily own it. Um, and if it can't work, it can't work. But if, if we can work to make this a win-win situation, I, I don't see why we wouldn't go down that path. You know what? Uh, the property owners here, do, do you want to address anybody, any of these concerns that were brought up? Sure, that'd be great. Give your name for the record. Because I'd like to understand what, you know, if you're going to go from whatever garage space is there now, how five feet's going to make a big difference in that, because you're not going to get them any further apart, so you're still going to have to access them from the garage doors facing each other. So pulling in and out of there is well, the going to be feet, just as easy, no matter how deep the, the building is. The theory is that five feet gives them enough feet to pull in four cars tandem. Okay. 
So Darren Anger, um, so as Nick stated, that extra five feet rounds us out to 36 feet in length. If we were to tear that fence down and then create four parking spaces, they would be tandem, and that would take, and we would have six spots on the back of our property versus the two we have now. So you're saying actually having a pull-in parking space at the end of the garage? Correct. There, you wouldn't. I'm not including parking inside the garages. Okay. Just, so just this, actually this is on the external actual, parking, so the garage would yeah. not go all the way to the property line. Garage would. Yep. With the a fence that would be two feet okay. at the property line. So we'd want to open the fence up mm -hmm. along the sides of the garages, and then have the opportunity to close that fence and then create nearly a 1,500 square foot patio space for, again, the you know, right now it's an insurance agency. We don't, I don't need full-blown retail. Nobody walks in. Most people that walk in are usually uninsured, probably the people you, you don't want to talk to, you, you know, want to say no to. Um, and so I feel like the property is underutilized and would like to make it a place of destination. And so um, quick thought is, you know, coffee house, um, fine meats and cheeses, you know, talk to, you know, citizens, myself, just what our needs are, where we go to all these other towns for, for these types of items. Um, tap room, talk to Energy City Brewing, actively selling Batavia residents, something that they're very interested in. And then um, Spice House Gindos, they're uh, another um, Batavia resident actively selling and uh, again, have, have interest in possibly coming in and, and using the space and so we're, we're thinking of being able to use the space more throughout the day versus just saying okay it's a coffee house it's open from seven to two right so we can be open from seven to two for a coffee house but then you know we can do you know tap room three nights a week if they want to whatever four nights a week from you know four to nine four to ten we're not talking we don't want a bar no one wants to work in a full-blown restaurant you know just that type of offering and so yeah, the five feet is that, that's the, the big part is taking the cars off the street and putting them on our patio so that if it becomes a place of destination, that access is easy to get into it. You have Rosati's directly across the street from us now. They're taking on twice the space mm -hmm. and now they're offering sit down, beer, wine. So now that's a place of destination versus people pulling in and running out or probably more than anything ordering just, you know, delivery. So more cars to uh, go on the street there. Um, the other part with, you know, with the garage, so the vision, right, the, with the, the garages are dilapidated. They're probably 70 years old. They're, they're beyond repair. We we're gonna do the roofs last year and we just looked at it and just wasn't worth it. We were like, you know, these, they, they need to come down. And, and then where my, one of my big struggles is on the west side is, is accessing that garage, having the, uh, vendors um, or trades going to Shannon Hall and just parking in front of the garage or they actually park literally in front of our patio space and they're just, they're all over it. And so that was my thought was like, okay, as a compensating factor, why don't I tear it, when we tear it down, why don't we rebuild it and have access on the property, assuming that, you know, either you're gonna be maybe brewing beer or, you know, doing this spice thing or who knows, you know, uh, at that point, but uh, just, just like they're trying to do is, you know, maximize my opportunity just, just as they are park district. And um, then take them and see the two, you can see the two white squares. Those are two of the several additions since 1885 flat roofs. They leak, they're a challenge. I'd like to, if there was an opportunity to attach the garages to the home and then our structure, and then, you know, your standard pitch gable roof, get water to run off, not sit and evaporate or penetrate into the, into our property. And um, I don't know, I can, there's a lot of different visions as far as, you know, then we're going to take that, the fence that's there now and move it to the side the east side, a little bit more towards the front of the house. Um, the two houses in back of Parkinson's kind of just finished the same project and putting their, they don't, they back up to a parking lot, right? So they created a patio space um, kind of on the side front yard of their property. Exactly what we're looking to do, something like that. 
and then reconfigure or redoing the garage on the east side the thought was you know even to pull out the roof line and then attaching it you know or running it into that uh, flat roof to eliminate flat roofs 100 percent but that would likely be as an overhang and then so you'd have some you know space from shade elements what have you so you'd have your choice if you know you wanted to see sun shade what have you depending uh what event or retailers performing their craft if you will at that point and then the other piece was if uh, the river street project if you know that takes off uh, 200 units i i believe um to a lot easier to get to the east side for me about a block and a half uh, versus getting to the other side of the table not that we want to neglect it by, by any means but uh just to accommodate and make it more attractive for those people that are coming into there and then current estimates it's about 200,000 for what we want to do and once attaching the to the actual property to attaching the garages to the structure you're gonna have to rewrap the whole house right so it's gonna look from what I can envision it should look pretty cool and so I have to assume that's gonna help property values and also to see other investors that come in town someone's spending money someone sees something around here and just give our east side a little shot in the arm maybe if you will and I, I sat with uh, Allison and Jim Eby on Thursday or Tuesday this past week and sharing what I want and I have one of their latest uh, renderings it's more green space but okay. up there last I think to ju to manage the drainage mm -hmm. concerns right that um, by the west garage and down where that car is shouldn't be parked right mm -hmm. I mean that that dip down that dips down so far I don't know how they're gonna correct that if they're how they're what they're adding to I, I don't know that's not my world it's you know insurance um, so far from an expert in that but it's 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 pretty severe so how they combat it I could see by needing to add the green space, that I'm sure that that helps resolve that problem. And meeting with uh, the park district, the only thing that I could get was there the five feet was they just said, well, then we have to redo our plans. We have to redo our plans, and there was any definitive answer to say this is exactly why. And I think that's rendering number three or four that that I've seen. So I think they've already been done. I, once. I think it would all have to do with turning radiuses in and out of sure. the parking spaces yep. there and how they have access to that parking lot or how they're going to configure that parking lot. Yeah, I measured from the 36 feet out is from, there's about three foot of bed on the back of the property within the patio space. Now measuring out 36 feet, you can go out 20 feet. And I'm, I believe from what I read and Chris Aston has shared with me is that the 20 feet is, is what's needed from where the edge is on the east side there. You, 20 feet exists today if they were to give that additional five feet. These are my <clears throat> very basic tools. I'm not, you know, by any means. So again, not my world, but it's just my vision, my plan, and what I can see. The way I see it, the ordinance in front of us is vacating the alley. Mm -hmm. If we, let's say, amend it to 13 feet, we're not giving away the property we still have have it and we can investigate it and go down that path if it doesn't work we can always do it obviously they'll make their changes but why this is the exact business owner we want and we want to support and and, and give an opportunity to invest in our city why would we shut that off right at the beginning without at least giving them an opportunity to investigate and see what we can do to make yeah. it happen don't challenge me, Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not challenging. I, I, um, the problem is we have to vacate. When we vacate an alley the way we're doing it, we have to specifically say in the ordinance who is getting what. Because otherwise, you can't just have an ordinance that vacates it because then that creates a split that you know isn't what we're trying to achieve here. So um, you would have to actually specifically define in the legal description what part of the alley is going to whom so and then we also have to change the plat as well so those two things have to change 
before we if we're, if we're going to change the dimension we have to change both of those things. so right now on the plat who owns that eight feet we do city that's that's city. it's all it's all public right away uh, so in this ordinance when we vacate the alley and our we are are we giving Darren that eight feet correct he's getting eight feet of the alley it's a 32 foot wide alley which is very wide for an alley and then he's getting this eight feet here right now that's that's where the the garage encroachment goes not quite up to that eight foot line so and then the right. park district will be getting the remainder of this so at the end of that they'd get 24 with this with the way we've platted it here right and typically uh, an alley driveway would be 10 feet 11 feet they're 10 feet 16 feet is a very common number for alleys okay. yeah. so you can get two lanes through it correct right so that would be 19 feet but even if we vacate do you know the the park district's plan like that apron what are they doing with that I mean, they can't possibly dig that up and make that part of their. They don't look like they're doing yeah. anything on this plan. Yeah, right. That they, corner. <clears throat> and it's yeah, got they, two drains. I can see two manholes are in the corner there at the extreme south. Uh, southwest. West corner. Right. Right in front of where the walkway is alongside the building. Yeah, and this is this is obviously not the most current plan, but their their plan is to put islands in and to reconfigure this driveway area in here too so i mean they're, they're proposing to modify this so the the driveway requirement for alley for driveways is to be 24 to 25 feet wide depending on the parking spaces so 20 feet is is really a one-way alley one-way aisle i should say so that's my problem is if we do that then we change their ability to use the property that they that we'd be giving to the park district well yeah. the only the only areas right where your hand is there mm -hmm that to the corner of his property that width so, so, this, is 20, so this is 24 feet yeah. based on the survey and if you go back to the picture it makes it to me makes it much more evident of what we're talking about is if you take that other five feet away the end space that's there in the middle of that aisle is a east wet or no a north south um aisle parking and then there's diagonal parking along the far west side up against the building. That's where I think the issues come in is you won't be able to make those turns in and out of there if there's parking in those end spaces. Because that alleyway will get narrow. You won't be able to go each way. I mean, I think they try to make it one way now. Right. This, this there. one here. Yeah, this, this kind of circulation oh, here, way. right. But if you move that out another five feet and you get a car up at the end of that. Well, we're just going up to the apron. Keep in right. mind, with the eight that, feet, that's what's in the ordinance. Right. Right. So right. But if you look at that visually, we're just easy. extending it that to the end of that cement. Yeah, that, that's we're not going five feet. The additional onto five the, feet yeah. is included in the cement apron. Is that what you're saying? Yes, the, the cement yeah. apron is the five feet basically. I thought it was eight feet. No, the no, eight, eight feet, feet is the garage. Feet, the garage already encroaches almost eight feet into the alley. <laughs> okay. So it's then, just, and then, that, and then just that apron. The apron so the, the apron, slab. which is another five feet or so, would be the Include additional Include the cement slab. slab. Right. So, that, so, this, that, so this dimension here, I think you said, is 20 feet? If you go um, back to the other plan, it shows what it is. I would assume it runs, yeah, it would be the same. So I went off the uh, west part of the east garage, and then I ran my tape along from the back of the house and out actually I actually have a picture of it um, and then ran a second tape measure across that was 20 feet and have a picture of it going down and it, it doesn't it's close but it, it doesn't get to the grassy area to the here right under the, the so the outer the edge of that concrete is yes yeah, so that's so eight feet plus five feet yeah that's 13 yeah. feet yeah so 13 would be to the edge here so they would, they would come across encroaching into this asphalt area somewhat and then back down so yeah, then I'll that's going to for so then from that point where the where the wherever it's wherever we vacate it you'd be looking to have a minimum of a 24 to 25 foot aisle plus whatever you know turning radius you're going to have to have to go around the parking lot itself 
Can you go to the other plan that you had that actually had the this one? I think it's that one or was it just one other space that showed the actual distances at the corner? Uh, this one? That, that one had there. It, it shows 24 feet. <coughs> yeah, so this the end the, of it would be 24 feet now with the 8 feet that's in the ordinance. If we take 5 more feet, you'd be. 5 more feet is going to be taken up. So it would be 19 feet in this section through here. Which technically I think that's big enough, right? For an alleyway? Not for a two way access drive under our ordinance, no. Okay. How far is the park district? They have those islands encroaching into the alleyway now, too. That's proposed. That's not existing. Okay. And, and the proposed stuff, and then proposed, you basically right. dog leg that coming in at the end there. So all these heavy all these heavy lines here is what's what was proposed under one of their parking lot versions. So you can kind of see, unfortunately, this is not a very good <coughs> scan, but um, you can kind of see where their no. parking improvements <laughs> are here right now. So I mean, if you go back to that concrete thing, that can't be part of the alleyway. Nobody's going to be driving over that concrete area anyway. They're driving over it now, so. Well, they're doing it to park illegally, so we can go in circles for that. <laughs> and keep in mind, the, the northern boundary there, that's just a line. That's all asphalt. Mm. I mean, that can be, they can, they can make it a 50-foot alley if they want to redraw the plans. There's, there's no building. That, I mean, that's all asphalt. Right, but I don't want to speak for the park district and say that we're going to make up their mind of how they want to reconfigure their parking lot. I understand that. But I don't want the park district speaking for us and what we right. want to do in an economic development. That's why I'm saying mm -hmm. if we can right. and I guess my not question say would no be, to this. If we give them the eight feet that's there now from eight feet, does, is there a 36-foot opening between the building that's there now that you're not going to take down no. and the end of that eight feet. If you go all the way through where the garage is, it looks like there's a space between the flat roof building and the garage now. Can you fit a 36 foot building in there? If you're looking for four parking spaces in it? No, the four are to the right, the, the existing. The existing building that has a white roof on it, which on you the, said was the a flat roof. The east side. On the west side. It would be the east. Or the east side, that's where you want to put a 36 foot building? That would no. That would be a. That would create a, a space of 36, roughly by 36 by 22. Okay. Create the four parking spaces. In this. Oh, area. so you take the garage down. The, west. the garage would be rebuilt. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Those those okay. spaces would not be legal spaces under our ordinance. I mean, we don't know. You know, tandem spaces are not legal. You could have two, depending on how oh. the width is. It may have two or three. Me, so. Me if I'm in between it. These are his existing two spots. Correct. This is a patio that he's going to. Tear down, and this is where he'll have two new spots. That's a garage. But he right needs, now. Garage. No, this is that's a garage. garage. Yeah, where your arrow this is. This is a garage. That's a patio. That's a patio. No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is yeah. this that's, is the garage. That's the fence. The fence is inside this here. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so you could do pull-in space. You could do pull-in spaces like that. Right. Can I can I make a point of order? I mean, is it since the park district is not here, we really can't make a decision without their input. It, unless is this on a critical timeline for this to be for for the next council meeting not for the next council meeting necessarily but I mean they they are planning on doing this parking lot this summer now they okay. still have to get some other zoning approval from us sure some of that so can, can we make sure they're here for for our next our next yeah. cow meeting and, and and push this to, to to next Tuesday so we can get their input and then and get this thing resolved I mean I we so can't we can't no meeting next Tuesday just so you know that was canceled for the Brotherhood dinner that's correct. But we could have a committee of the whole meeting on Wednesday the 21st if you wanted. No, it's plan commission. That's plan, plan commission. commission. Yeah. We, I mean, yeah. we can go to the next two weeks. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, that's. And I guess my question or my direction to staff would be, can we make sure, can you look at what you would approve for the park district for the turning radiuses on the parking lot and where you can put the islands? with both the eight feet that it's proposed with now and with the 13 feet with the other five feet added to it yeah we'd have to look at see what the current current plan is and, okay. and how they're going to configure that um and then how that would affect if they had to push an additional right. five feet further how that's going to affect how the that would change because it looks like the way the parking lot is set up now they route stuff in from 
going west in the alleyway has to go to the right mm -hmm. and what comes east in the parking lot has to go around to the basically the I left think to I come think back into those yeah it's more or less one way heading south stairs. this way and then right up that way right and where the car is that's illegally parked at that grass line and the apron where i want to mm -hmm. extend to they're even equal yeah. yeah there's it's not it's not going to be some jagged mm -hmm. you know thing it, or it would be if that was the case right right my concern on this is if you look i mean if you look at the whole picture and all the opportunity that is there for the park district that five feet is is a minuscule part that can be rather important to the east side of, of our downtown and economic development mm -hmm. so i don't want to you know give all the weight oh the park district walks in here and goes oh no we want that five feet well let's make it win-win yeah. if, if we if, if they're open to working something through i think that's a great plan i i, and, I think to your point it for the small amount of spaces they want versus the four spaces that would open up on wilson mm -hmm. i think it makes a lot of sense i do think we just need to have the park district here so we can walk this through you know because I, I think it makes a lot of sense we just we just need to get all parties involved here well exactly what nick is saying we have if we just look at it as two property owners that are vying for access to their properties it shouldn't matter whether or not it's the park district or another party we've got two people that want the same access to something and we're giving up control i would like to give up control to what Nick's saying, the best win-win scenario, which has larger benefits than to just one side, solely because they're another public entity. Mm -hmm. In um, addition to that, they have been maintaining it, so I think that that is something important to consider as well. And they will continue to do so after it's vacated, too. I mean, they're going to maintain and I think, part of their parking lot. You know, so. it still has to be better, but it has to be public domain because it has to be able to publicly allow access to those three properties that are not just this one that wants to do something with it but the other two that are there that eventually or may want to do something with it we just don't know about that yet because they still have to have access to their garages that are mm -hmm. their, their property right and he needs access to his garages right now right that he's willing to give up so mm -hmm. right. and there already is an issue with his access getting access to it as right. as currently right. Yeah, I'd like to see us just continue it and have the park district here and, you know, hopefully be right. able to work out something even with shared parking back there because I think that that makes even more sense that the park district isn't going to use it 24-7, that property, and that's a lot of parking within a block, block and a half of downtown. Yeah. Well, I make a motion we table this for two weeks. Second. 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 Good. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Curious. Thank you. And we'll make sure that you know what date we're going to be back here. With. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Darren, did you want, you want to start your, oh, yeah. your plan? <laughs> okay. Let's go on to item number six uh, the McKee Street pedestrian crossings. This is really an informational item more than anything else. Um, bringing it forward in case council wants to, wishes to have any discussion. Um, I think Laura informed you verbally, and then I, I put it in writing that on um, Sunday, February 4th, one of the rapid flashing beacons at the key was struck by a vehicle, and that basically ended its useful life. That, that device is useful life, and in the end of December. So a few weeks prior to that, the FHA, Federal Highway Administration, basically came out and said that those devices could no longer be reinstalled if they, are, if they do reach the end of their useful life. So we're going to have to um, basically remove the remaining device at McKee Street, and so that, that, that crossing will no longer have the rapid flashing devices. Um, and at this time, again, the staff's recommendation was to basically install compliant uh, crosswalk signage at McKee Street. Um, because direction from council at budget time was not to budget any any funds for any other options. So that's why, I, I, again, I'm just bringing it forward tonight to make you aware and, and turn it over to discussion for you. I have a thought. Since we have I don't know, six of these in different spots in town, 
um, if this one is not functional, can we make another one not functional and put pieces? <laughs> move, <of one? laughs> move it. Being Don't serious you. about this because I think that this one is probably the most used one that right. we have, yeah. and probably in the location that needs to be the most visible of anyone in town. We have a spare, and that's what I was going to ask next: was if we have a spare, can we replace it because it still has a useful life? Well, no, the, the device that was that was well, I know the one that the car definitely broke. does not have it a does not get <laughs> that. So, so the, the FHA guidance says that when a device reaches the end of its useful life, it cannot be re-erected. But you have a spare. Well, we have a spare. I guess that doesn't mean anything if, unless you want to go against what the FHWA says. The fact that we have a spare doesn't. Well, because it got damaged to me does not mean that's the end of its useful life. The spare is not. And it's ended yeah, it's yeah. life. <laughs> neither is any one of the other ones that we have. I mean, honestly, I think that in some ways. I would advise you to talk with Attorney Drendel before you guys okay. go on that path. <laughs> well, there's a valid argument. If your car gets in an accident, right. did it end its useful life? No, you repair it. And right. And that's what I say its useful is life. the useful or, part of it is it totals. warns traffic <laughs> that there are people that are going to cross going the street road. <laughs> and should make it a safer crossing no by being functional and being out there. I think our concern is that the um, Federal Highway Authority memo suggests they should not be repaired. That they're Correct. hoping that uh, these things will go it's like, away. It's like a lot of service. Yeah. It, but I guess it's <coughs> can see repair as in, hey, it started malfunctioning. Mm -hmm. This mm -hmm. is not a so instance where out. it just stopped working. No, it was destroyed. I mean, it was, I get it. Right. But <laughs> is, I don't believe that was their intent. Maybe it is because they don't like them. Yeah, but exactly. I don't believe that, that is their intent. Their intent they exactly right. Them. Right. I think they're worried about liability that they're going to get sued, and because they approved them and they okayed it, they're going to be on the hook for it. That's my thought. But that would still happen with all of the remaining ones in town because you're still you're not getting rid of the liability then if that's their thought they should say you're not replacing that one and every single one needs to come down i mean these they're were kind of experiments right. these i know were an experiment they're, they're that was started in 2008 playing both sides and these were an experiment that was started in 2008 actually it was they were started several years prior to that but the fhwa finally said in 2008 that other municipalities can experiment with them they started down in florida and they were they were fairly prevalent in a couple of communities down there. So the FHWA said, yep, let's experiment with them. We'll give you official approval to experiment with them. Ten years later, nine, ten years later, here we are, and the FHWA has concluded that they don't appreciably improve safety at intersections, and therefore they should be just kind of discontinued. And that's what they said. We're not going to allow any new installations, and as the old installations sit out there, they'll still be permitted to sit out there. You don't have to take them out. Um, but as they reach the end of their useful life, you need to take them out of service and, and, and they're going to disappear. So following that, strictly the way it's written, over the next 10, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, they're all going to disappear. They're not going to be around anymore. I guess my, my argument to fix it would be we plan for the useful life by having a spare. And Again, Alderman, you need to talk right, to the attorney I, about that because believe me, I the FHWA to them specifically says I think it needs to go back out there. It changed in the this FHWA memo came out in the interim. I mean, yeah. we mm -hmm. did have the spare there because oh, yeah, we had a spare because replace and right, they were approved. Right. We installed six. Like you said, this six, seven just locations. came out last November. Is that correct or December? Which one? December. The December. The, the, the December updated <laughs> their guidance. Then right. now their guidance is you cannot put up any new ones anymore. Alan. Yes, is, there have yeah. been a lot of concerns about that intersection or that mm -hmm. crossing. Lots of concerns, and um, and we've had some accidents there in addition, mm -hmm. and some near misses. And I know that at one point you said, "Let's get a some sort of crossing at Houston," mm -hmm. even though it wasn't approved. I don't understand if we're going to put a standard crosswalk there, why don't we go back to Houston, which is what our consultant had recommended, right. which leads us right downtown, and which is what people the use. The answer from IDOT was they don't allow standard crosswalks across a four-lane highway, which is a lie because they do in Geneva across 38. No, I, for no seven the, the, that the, the issue at Houston Street was the rapid flashing beacon being too close. Well, to no, they wouldn't even let us stripe it for a crosswalk. I was Across that, 31, I they will not they let us stripe right. it. They I stood. don't recall that, Alan. 
I mean, that's what we were told, and that I'll find I've got an email from it where that's what's stated is they don't allow in what is it area one. Well, then why District would they one, allow District it in one? Key? Because it's further away from the right. stoplight at Wilson. No, I think that had to do with the rapid flashing beacon. Right, but yeah. the crosswalk thing was is if they were going to allow the rapid flashing beacon at McKee Street, they were not going to allow us to stripe across a four-lane highway a block away from that, which I told them is BS because Geneva has it all the way out 38, and that's six or seven lanes if you want to count parking and turn lanes. Yeah, I, I don't know that. I, I, we can look into the striping side, but I don't remember the striping side being an issue. It's the beacon, I believe, that was the issue in proximity to this. Because that was one of the options I wanted to have was to have just a simple crosswalk stripe set up at Houston Street mm -hmm. because we've got the big sidewalk, we've got I don't the think connection to the bike path, everything is right there, and they, we were told that, that we couldn't do that. I, I can't remember... I don't know if this, if Google will show. Um, I think it was a consensus issue as the group here. No. I no. Think, the state no, told us we could not do it. Yes. And that was one of the no, options. No, I, well, my because I made the argument is that the police chief weighed in and said that there was a possible um, sense of secure, some false sense of security there. And so that was about the island in the middle of the road is what yeah. Gary said well, with the false sense of security. In addition to the crossing, we talk, well, I, that's my recollection. So I'm wondering if we could revisit it then mm -hmm. and let's look into it and just see what the options would be at this point. Where'd they go? Alderman, if I could weigh in real quickly on that. Um, the issue with the pedestrian crossing from the police department's perspective at the time was that the crosswalk they wanted to uh, put across the northern uh, portion of the roadway there and then they wanted to put the pedestrian, initially they wanted to put it in the northern uh, edge of the intersection there, but they said it was too narrow there, so the alternate was to move it to the south end. So that didn't make any sense that we'd have the crosswalk at the northern end of the intersection and the pedestrian uh, right. island at mm -hmm. the south end of the intersection. That's where we said it was a safety issue. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was the concern. We were, we were okay with it in the north end of the intersection, I but I think uh, the state said that there was not enough... Uh, uh, with to put that in there uh, right to put an that's island and have it correct. split. Yeah. That was the uh, yeah So this is the resurfaced route 31 which they just resurfaced what two years ago I mean this has got striped crosswalk so I, I don't think it's a striped crosswalk issue That's I mean that striped crosswalk came, went back in after the state resurfaced the road um, As chief Jewell just said that this one had had a, a space issue That's why I couldn't go in there. We ended up on the south side of Houston Street because that allowed for the six foot roughly six foot wide Center median. Right. That, that would have taken out the turn lane there as well. Right. right. Well, and then they did the turn well, the lane, turn lane was never there. Yeah, the, yeah, they did the turn lane without yeah. telling us. Right. The turn lane was never there. The turn lane was a striped median <laughs> like this. So, um, going back to what Alderman Wolf just said, um, you know, getting a striped crosswalk at Wilson Street, I don't think necessarily will be an IDOT issue. Because again, they just have one south of there on First Street. Um, it was the rapid flashing beacon that was the issue, and that's why they moved moved it one block further north up to McKee Street. That is my recollection as well, Gary. Yeah, yeah. I just remember that that was yeah. what was told to us that IDOT said we could not stripe it as a normal crosswalk, and I said, well, one, we've got them in town here because yeah, I, I don't think that's First right. Street. I mean, I don't think that that's right. I think again, and said, there's one my street. argument was is that. Geneva has them across 38, and they said they wouldn't do it on a state highway. So I'm sorry to give you all headaches spinning <laughs> around the globe. Um, there's two separate issues there. There's, we can certainly pursue a standard crosswalk at Houston if that's what everyone wants. That's just an IDOT permit to see if they'll grant that. That's up to IDOT. And second is back to McKee Street. What do we want to do with McKee Street? Right now, the direction from staff, at least, is to remove the other rabbit flashing beacon and install a standard crosswalk sign inch and leave it at that per, unless council gives direction otherwise. We have no, no budgeted funds to pursue any other options at this time. I think we should ask the attorney. I think we should ask the attorney as well because I'd like to know if we've planned for replacement by having an extra one here, that's not at the end of its useful life. And it's also not the end of its useful life just because somebody hit it. Mm -hmm. You don't throw things out because they were broken by accident if something wears down then yes i understand that i and yes maybe their intent is yes let's get rid of them but you could interpret the the way they wrote that as it is not its end of useful life mm -hmm. um but 
Are you at all concerned about the um, near misses and accidents that have occurred there already? I mean, yes. are, are we, do we really want to, to, I mean, if we have an opportunity to do something else and make it safer, or do we really want to put it back in? It, well, it, I think we, we, we had this discussion, and I was one of those. I don't, li I don't like them. I know people do like them. But we're in a situation that we have the ability to replace it because we plan well, We don't for know it. that we do. Well, we, we technically do. We may not legally have the ability to. We technically have the ability to replace it. So we should pursue to see if that's possible. I agree. Let's put a crosswalk at Houston. People have been asking about that. And people cross anyway. Like <laughs> right. I said years or I said months ago, I cross to my neighbor's driveway. I don't have a crosswalk on 31. I just walk across the street when nobody's, when there's no cars. So it's, it provides a sense of security. I think people have gotten better with them and they understand it more. They're still dangerous. Crossing a four lane highway takes more than traffic lights and, and crosswalks. It takes eyes. And if people aren't using their eyes and they're not using their head, accidents are going to happen. But we should give, the benefit of the doubt that we have the the technical ability to replace it and we should find out legally if what the interpretation is we or can, make a phone call we can check with attorney that. drendel and, and sure I, and i just want to point out the third option is that if you do feel that this offers you the opportunity to take out a uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacon that you feel is in a problem area you certainly have sufficient basis in that memo to take that action you know, and I have lead, lead service line, you know, sitting in the yard at Public Works because occasionally we run across a lead water service. It doesn't mean I would install lead water service just because I have it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the fact that we have it doesn't necessarily give us the right to install it, which goes to Attorney Drendel. Well, I, I just, go ahead, Marty. Question on liability of all of them then. If they're going to say exactly. that the reason we're not replacing it is because it's a dangerous situation, yet leave all of the other ones, who does that then fall upon? They didn't say that. Are they? they well, they're they saying, just, they're, I know they're kind of half they coding. Yeah, but, but it's they won't but, say but, that, they won't, they won't allow it to go back in because. But if you read the memo, they explicitly say that existing installations can remain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I know they can remain, but as a policy decision, should they remain if they're kind of coding it that we're not allowing it because it's a safety issue, but you can leave them because we're not saying the other ones come out. Thereby, it falls back on you, the city. Well, I mean, I'll point to a staircase. The staircase is grandfathered in or not grandfathered in, however you want to look at that. I mean, so do you fix the staircase in order to meet today's codes? I mean, the flash, same, the that's not the same. Their is at best saying it's ineffective. At worst, it's, you know, dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Dan? Does the staff have an opinion about removing all of them? I don't think we need to remove all of them. What about is, just those across four lanes rather than two lanes? That you may get mixed opinions from staff, but I believe the two remaining ones at Morton and Union, I don't think have had the same types of issues that we had at McKee. What, I think what you, visibility at Morton and Union Visibility, is, I think, is just if that's longer. something we want to talk about, I mean, yeah. I think that's the biggest issue with the one on McKee Street. We need to open up further sight lines in front of it from each side. Boy, and we did. I mean, we took, where we took down as much trees as we could take down out there and added lighting out there. I mean, we, we did just about everything we could. And we still need to go through another summer season where people are going to be out there constantly using it. I mean, part of it is, as I look at this, they can put out a memo and say don't fix them after they break, but have they spent a dollar yet to educate the public on why they're there and what they should do when they pull up to them? I think we We've did. Spent, I think we have spent we, more time we, we trying to do that with our public yeah. Yeah. than the state or the federal government has and in allowing them to begin with. And I think that's something that I think we, we lose sight of. You know, how long did it take from, what, 1967 when they started to mandate seatbelts in a car to get to a shoulder harness to get to the point where everybody wears them every day? You know, it doesn't happen overnight. We have to keep forcing people to stop at these, and eventually they will all learn how to stop when somebody pushes the button and makes it flash. I think it's that, that adapt. Adopt, adaption, adoption. I mean, I think it's that, it's that human behavior is not meshing well with the rapid flashing beacons. And the reason why there isn't that mesh then is what's led the FHA to say, FHWA to say, these aren't meshing well. After a decade, people are still a little confused, drivers and pedestrians, so let's just stop the program. And that's what they did. 
Then why don't they just end it? This seems like right. well because they they have a they have a financial. I mean, they don't want to put a financial. I'm, I'm, I'm I can't speak I, for them. I, I get that, but, but it seems like a really weak stance. <laughs> yeah. It is. Here. yeah. If, if we agree that this is not is. a cool device, shut them down. Take them down. I well, think like, you guys all have that option. You can you can decide any time if you want to pull them all out. It's going it's going to Dan's point. It's going to the <clears throat> public perception that these things there are issues and there's conflicting information about it. And now we're getting more information from the state that's saying they're they're discontinuing it for safety reasons. And we're trying to promote the other ones that are still here, but those are safe. But are they? You know, it's just it's a confusing mixed message that has surrounded all of these things from the beginning they've been put in. Yeah, this is advice that a smoker gives another smoker. <laughs> Let's finish your pack and then don't buy another one. No. <laughs> I, I believe it was on a test basis though anyway. Yeah, when it first introduced this in approval, 2008 yeah. it was. Yeah, exactly. And they provided evidence in that memo that That's accidents, enough. more accidents, and there's more safety concerns with them in than without. So the formal process would have been for them to issue a final formal memo approving them. In this case, they issued a final memo rescinding the interim approval. Right. I think staff can check with Attorney Drendel I, I on both. That would be we what can we can check do. with. Can we reinstall our spare out on Rotavia Avenue? And what his opinion is on keeping the rest of them in place? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Our major concern with this is that. Because this thing has been knocked out, is this a uh, is this a new installation? So it's not necessarily end of useful life, but are we re are we re we're installing a new beacon up there? Right. So that's you know the sentence above that's the one that's most problematic for us. Yeah. It causes us the most concern. Mm -hmm. In a, in addition to the sight lines at Route 31 and McKee Street, and I think all the four lane pedestrian mm -hmm. beacon crossings are more dangerous than the two lanes. I think they increase right. safety in the two lanes, no doubt. Yep. Yeah. Potentially increase the the uh, uh, risk at the four lanes, but in addition to the uh, the sight line issues there, you're also dealing with a major arterial that right. intersects with the state road, and that I think higher pre, speed, right? Higher <laughs> speed, more volume, right? Um, just more turning actions and that sort of thing there. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the three years we've had them installed, we've had three incidents that involve directly or uh, indirectly pedestrians at that intersection. And in the three years before that, we had none. Mm -hmm. I think that speaks volumes. Mm -hmm. and, well, in the same period of time, how many pedestrian involved accidents that we have on 31? <clears throat> because there was at least two at Wilson Street, and I believe there was one at Main Street in, the, in that uh, roughly that same time period that I can think of. Right. So, I mean, I don't want to quantify, I'd quantify more with the road than I would with whatever traffic device you want to equate it to. Now that we have some clarity on Muddy the Waters again, because um, I mean, the last half of what I put in the packet was Rahat's memo from late last year. I mean, there are many other options. Well, not many. There are other viable options. Um, there are the Hawk signal, there's a traffic signal, there's road diet, all of which could be pursued. Um, so just keep those all in the back of your mind, too, at some point in time, depending on what Attorney Drendel's memo right. says. And I'd also like staff to pursue whatever it takes to put the the signed and striped crosswalks on 31 at Houston, at Houston. Houston Street. Because to me, that's the heaviest pedestrian traffic other than Wilson yeah. Street. That's a that's a right application to, to IDOT, and they're ultimately their say one way or the other yeah, okay. whether they would allow that. Or not. That's not us. Okay. Yeah. No. Mike, if I could have one more question. I know, Chief. There was a speed sign there on Route 31. And I come that way every day, and I think speed's a big issue there because sometimes I'd see cars flashing on the sign, 50, 53 miles an hour, and it's 40 miles an hour, slowing down to 35. Do you have results of that sign being up? We're not continually taking data from that, no. Okay. Uh, we do periodic uh, polls, but it, honestly, it drains the battery much faster when we're, when we're collecting data off yeah. those machines. Okay. So it was just a matter yeah. of keeping the keeping the lights on yeah. more than anything else there, and we we don't have that permanently affixed there. That's a uh, a portable uh, sign, but we try to keep it there a lot just just as a deterrent. Okay, I, Mike, and I, I think going going from to the north as well, that that area is complicated by the fact that you go from you go to a, a foliaged or a covered area that road you know right at McKee is where it gets covered, so it gets right. dark, 
and so I mean the sight lines there are goofy as well. Yeah. So and people are accelerating out of a out of an inter intersection, and it's just it's just you know perfect storm right, right there. It's as been you're going south. There's a hill, so you yeah. don't really mm -hmm. see yeah. the um, flashing light until you I mean with enough time to slow down. Yeah. It's been three or four years, maybe even a little longer than that, since the city council authorized the mayor to write a letter to IDOT asking IDOT to do a speed study or evaluation of the speed study out on 31. So, if that all works. I'd be all for that. I'd also think that, you know, not just that, but the type of flashing lights that they have on Randall Road, you know, be prepared to stop that's two blocks or three blocks as you're approaching a hill before you get to a stoplight. Yeah, those are only permitted in those circumstances. Right. You can't have them. You can't have them on a stop. Well, you can see the stoplight from a thousand feet away. Right. You're not allowed to have that type of sign. Well, be on the other side of North Avenue or Maple Lane on 31 with those okay. lights flashing. So Anything we can pursue all those things. Um, right now, we'll seek direction from Attorney Drundell and okay. we can seek direction from IDOT on, on a standard crosswalk at Houston Street. Just to just to clarify something I think you said earlier, um, just because one of them got knocked out, but the other one is still there, we're maybe in a better time for that to happen, given that it's the winter months and we're not dealing with a lot of pedestrians there, but um, staff doesn't feel that that's going to be a problem if we get to spring, one of the signals is there, the other one is not. No, I, I, we're not in compliance right now. We need to take out that other one or bag it or do something okay. with it to make it not So we need to get this resolved right. fairly quickly as well. Yeah, the, the only reason we haven't done it so far is for the last 9 out of 11 days we've been dealing with snow. <laughs> oh, so, oh, and yeah. right. once, once the guys Hats break... off to the job that they yeah, you know. Once <laughs> the guys break free, we'll, we'll get that either bagged right. or, or turned off, something to make sure right. that, that one's not operational. Okay, and my argument would be is half of it's still functional and still operational. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what Attorney Drendel says. I'll go argue it. Get the wizard out there. Okay. So we have direction for staff. Yes. And now we get to move on to the fun of tax abatements. Okay. Lucy, you want to start here. this out? Yeah. Okay. So um, here we have four resolutions that are tax levy resolutions to abate the levy for bonds that the city chooses to pay from other sources other than real estate taxes. The county levies the debt repayment automatically, and so the city must formally abate the debt through resolutions. Um, the total of all these abatements <coughs> for the tax levy year of 2017 is $3,756,669. So this amount will be paid from the revenue sources listed here in each resolution rather than property tax bills. Are there any questions? I have one on the the first one for the fire station refunding. How much longer do we have to pay on that? 2025. 2025, okay. Peggy, do you have anything to add? No, okay. I have a question. I, I get why this is being done. Why these years, why does it go back 2012 and why is 2014 missing? Probably the date of issue when they were yeah, issue. refunded. Right, those are the dates of the refunding, the year that it was done. Oh, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Would someone like to make a motion to recommend to council the approval of resolution 18-21-R for um, fire station refunding to be paid from sales tax? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So Opposed? Was what? The motion was Chanzet. Second was... You were. Take it. <laughs> you were the second. Um, would someone like to make, do you have that? Are you good? Mm -hmm. Okay. Would someone like to um, make a recommendation to council the approval of resolution 18-22-R for the IEPA refunding a uh, source of the abatement, the water sewer revenue? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Would someone like to make a motion to recommend to council the approval of resolution 18-23-R for um, the payment of the electric refunding out of the electric revenue? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. 
Would someone like to make a motion to recommend to Council the approval of Resolution 18-24-R for the repayment of the drainage capital, um, CH capital bonds out of the general fund? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, you want those on consent? I think so. Yeah, we can put it on consent. Okay, next up is uh, resolution 18-25-R, renewing the contract for AID victim services. I have that. So we have been um, using the Association for Individual Development to provide victim and crisis intervention since 2017. And they've done a good job. Um, they come when the police and fire have contacted them and they follow up with those um, in need for counseling. And it's recommended that we renew this contract uh, for the amount of 17,000 for 2018 with an option to extend for a second and third year. Are there any questions or comments? I'll just make a comment. I think this is probably one of the best uses of money that we spend each year mm -hmm. um, to take whatever load we can off of our staff that we have in both fire and police departments. Um, I think it's something that I know personally that a lot of people have just praised the things that have come out of this, the contact that they have um, with this group, whoever shows up there, um, both from our departments, I've heard it internally and from people that have actually availed of the services that have been provided. Um, it's really, I think, probably the best money we spend. Chief, do you have any comments? No, just I would add that they provided, uh, you know, invaluable service for our people, and they really, we really believe they keep down in our, our repeat responses to uh, certain calls we get throughout the year. Definitely with the police department, I think the fire department would probably agree with that. Thank you. I, I just have a quick question. I, I just, you notice that the, the service hours jumped in a huge, you know, from 2016. Mm -hmm. Is that, do we know, is, is that attributable to any, I mean, we went from, it would, you know, 2015 was 456 hours, then 403 hours, then 595, which is, I mean, it is what it is, but I'm just wondering if there's, is that attributable to anything? I would, I, I don't know, but my, I guess my uh, educated speculation would be that they're doing more follow-up now and we're dealing with more uh, subjects that have you know mental illness and that mm -hmm. sort of thing that requires repeat call outs mm -hmm. okay uh, i can think of one offhand right now where they've been out probably eight to ten times for us just mm -hmm. with the one individual i, I noticed a spike in fan and not just um the hours but in clients serve that implies right. that entire families are being, families, sorry, right. being mm -hmm. served right. correct that's correct yeah. yeah if you look at our especially our police reports, and you see the amount of domestic yeah. calls, oh, all yeah. the things we have to deal with. Yeah. I think that, to me, points out why the hours are so high. Yep. Anything else? All right, would someone uh, like to make a recommendation to counsel the approval of Resolution 18-25-R, authorizing the execution of a one-year renewable contract for victim and crisis intervention services with the Association for Individual Development? So, so moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Who was that one? Meitzler and Malay. <laughs> okay. Eminem. Uh, anyone opposed? The ayes have it. <coughs> okay. Um, next up would be resolution 18-26-R, renewing a contract for Drendel and Jansen's uh, local prosecution. Yours All right. Uh, Drendel and Jansen uh, started providing the local prosecutor services um, in 2016 when um, our other law firm retired. Uh, they've done a good job, uh, apparently a seamless job, I mean seamlessly transitioning in. They charge $2,400 a month and staff, staff recommends that uh, we renew their contract. Um, they also, this contract would provide an option to extend for a second and third year. Are there any questions? Uh, some of the things they do, I should add, um, they appear at pros and prosecute all traffic and ordinance violations for the Batavia Police Department on the first, second, and third Tuesday of each month, and they handle other prosecution-related correspondence 
to include additional motions, continuances, and court appearances, notices to officers, offenders, victims, and witnesses as required. It seems like a lot for um, for twenty four hundred outlets. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions or comments? And I, I think I mentioned staff recommends this is approved, uh, that we approve this. Would anyone like to make a motion to um, recommend to council the approval of resolution 18-26-R authorizing the execution of a one-year renewable contract with Jen Drendel and Jansen's Law Group to provide local prosecutor services? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. I think that can go on consent, too. All right. That would take us down to project status. Okay. Um, from community and economic development, uh, we have, of course, received the submittal for one Washington Place plan development amendments. And on Monday night, it went <coughs> to the Historic Preservation Committee and um, they unanimously uh, voted in approval of the amendments. Also, staff has met with several developers regarding um, speculative industrial buildings in the area, so that continues to be a popular project. Um, also, we conducted the development review meeting internally for the windmill landings and the Prairie Commons projects. Um, Plan Commission had a public hearing on proposed zoning changes for the southeast corner of First Street and Mallory Avenue and a comprehensive plan amendment on the west side of Washington Avenue north of Gore Street. The Plan Commission will hear a proposed zoning map amendment for a property that's located near the southeast corner of Fabian and Nagel Boulevard to change the zoning from general commercial to light industrial that is um, facilitating an expansion of an existing business. <coughs> Also, two new leases were recently announced for Northeast Business Park buildings, um, one at 1160 Pearson Drive, an 82,000 square foot facility, and also at 1250 Douglas Road, a 50,000 square foot facility, which, Scott, I believe that was just built last year, right? Yes, that's the new one. Mm, that's the new one. That's great. And then also on Friday, um, working collaborative, collaboratively with Kane County in the state of Illinois, as well as um, many departments internally, um, the city had completed and submitted its comprehensive response to the request for proposal from the indoor farming enterprise. Um, and hopefully at the Batavia site is selected and the, the uh, project is built as planned. It would, uh, what they're looking at now is building on a vacant parcel. And so the, the project would represent a tremendous amount of, of increment also. Um, so the state's RFP transmittal indicates that there are several other sites um, that are under consideration, um, but we're very hopeful that we have distinguished ourselves, um, in particular looking at the, um, the dedication to agriculture in Kane County, but also the um, dedication of organizations located close to us that are um, provide food to those in need, and namely Northern Illinois Food Bank, mm -hmm. which supports over 800 um, food organizations just in Northern Illinois alone. Um, I think one of their most important programs is the uh, Backpacks program for the students in uh, Batavia Public Schools and other public schools. Um, one of the, the, the areas in, in hunger that is missing is when those children are not at school, they may still suffer from hunger. And so Northern Illinois Food Bank has a program where they drop off a backpack of food for children on Friday, 
and the kids bring those backpacks back empty on Monday to be uh, refilled by Northern Illinois Food Bank. So we made sure to highlight those things in our proposal to this organization because not only do they have a mission to be a profitable indoor farming business, they um, also uh, have a, a philosophical goal of um, this type of agriculture can feed the world. So um, we made sure to highlight those things in our, in our presentation. Uh, public works, as the weekly report to you all said, it was all about the snow. Um, I had the opportunity this past Friday to ride in one of our snow plows, and I can tell you, my back hasn't recovered since. <laughs> um, that is hard, hard work um, operating those snow plows. You are uh, bouncing all over on the inside of that truck with every um, you know, bump in the road. Uh, and God forbid you hit one of those reflectors on 31. <laughs> That'll let you know you're alive. The gentleman who I was uh, riding with while I took a 30 minute ride with him, this was his 16th hour of work with two 30 minute breaks in each of those eight hour shifts. And um, it, despite, it, you would think that at that point he'd be complaining about uh, how tired he was, but I, he was glad to do the work. Um, our Batavia Street crews are so proud of the job that they do for this city. And um, I also had the opportunity to talk to several business owners um, during the <laughs> snowstorm, after the snowstorm, and they were really impressed, Gary, with the fact that the crews went out to take the snow off the streets before the big snows hit, that we had the front end loaders out there with the dump trucks filling them up with snow to make sure that there was space for that snow. And then today, I saw them out there again, and yesterday, moving the large piles of snow out of people's way so that they can again start using the public um, parking spaces. And it not only puts a strain on our, our uh, public <coughs> works crews, but also on our first responders because um, people are out there, they're getting into, into accidents and they need help. And our first responders often have to spend extra time, call extra people in, and they're glad to do it too, to be there at the time when people need them. So a lot of thanks to everybody and um, all those city employees who came to work on Friday, despite the fact that many schools were closed, many businesses were closed, but they made it here to work. So I want to thank him for that. Um, Water has worked with the city attorney to draft an agreement that will help the city to address fire hydrants on private properties that are in disrepair. And in engineering, final preparation for uh, Area 3 and Ward 1 uh, drainage projects. We're getting those all ready so that they're um, ready to be let for bid. On buildings and grounds, Electrical is planning work at Public Works to isolate emergency circuits from day-to-day -day circuits. And in uh, administration for Public Works, met with Team Technologies to discuss their electric growth and other opportunities for growth in Batavia. Had a good meeting out there. Um, in fact, Team Technologies is a, a growing business. They. Um, they are a plastic injection molding operation, so they are uh, using more and more electricity. In fact, uh, they've, they've come to the point where they're about to cross the threshold into becoming a, Gary, what's the designation? Large? Large general service. Large general Over service. Large service. Yeah, so we had a nice conversation with them. Um, I also just wanted to touch base with you earlier today. I sent out an email that was both a summary of um, our discussion from the last committee, the whole meeting about how we wanted to proceed with the strategic planning process and um, to ask when you would like to have that next meeting because I know the, we are not having a committee of the whole meeting next week. And I had suggested Wednesday, but that's the plan plan commission meeting. Um, so would you like to have that next strategic plan discussion on the 27th, or would you like to have a special meeting at which we just discuss the strategic plan? Um, we could, the 22nd, Thursdays are always difficult. It seems like there's a lot of events that get scheduled in Batavia 
because there's always Monday meetings and Tuesday meetings and so shall I put it on the 27th agenda or would you like to move it to the first um, committee of the whole meeting in March it seems like we should have a meeting designated my my I mean I think if possible, that would be the best way to go, just have a strategic planning meeting. But I understand that might not be possible. Mm -hmm. We, we kind of said we were going to do this on a monthly basis. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, and we're already, we haven't had one meeting yet, and we're already pushing it back a month. <laughs> 27th. I'd say we put on the 27th, and we confine ourselves to the step one that was identified. In Agreed. Sounds good. Laura set out, and that way, everybody prepare for that, so we can get through it and achieve something in our first meeting. Very good. That sounds good. Let's do that. Let's put it on the 27th, force ourselves to do it, and let's make some headway and get going. Eat your Brussels sprouts. Can't. <laughs> okay, I sent out the, uh, the documents that are the survey about the mission vision values and also the SWOT analysis. So if anybody has any questions about those, feel free to contact me. Um, the Friday before the meeting is fine to get me the response for the survey from the survey so that I can compile all of that and give it to you the Monday before the meeting so you can have that at least for a data to look over those results. Does anyone have any questions for me? Great. Okay. No. We're I think we're other. Down, down to other. Does anyone have any others? You're up. I move we adjourn. Second. second. <laughs> a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Good night.